and we're back with another episode of arranging video game music for band and orchestra. Orchestra and band. Bid orchestra. I'm your host, the RPG Guy. And today we talked a, uh, a bit the other last episode about the fundamentals of woodwind, you know, just kind of the principles of woodwind orchestration, what goes into it, and all that hubbity bub. Today we're going to get into the actual specifics. Um, and today we're going to start with the flute section. Many composers, many young composers, um, debate, argue, and like to try to point out that writing for flute is easy to do. And then being an educator to a degree, you um, review what these young people, these young composers have written and find out they know nothing about writing for flute and do very stupid things. And so because of that, this is going to be very helpful. Before you begin to brag about how much you, how wonderfully you can write for flute, let's actually write for flute and see what you do know and what you don't. Writing for flute, yes, isn't as hard as maybe writing for hmm, bassoon or writing for oboe. There's a lot, there's not as many rules and there's a lot more freedom um, to get specific passages you want out of the flute than it is the other woodwinds, um, primarily. But remember that f just because you can do something doesn't really mean you should. Um, and that will apply to many aspects of the flute section as well as the rest of the um, orchestra. And we'll do the do's and the don'ts throughout this video. The four flutes that you see before you, the four types of flutes that you see before you, are the most common flutes that you will see. Um, and really when we talk about preparing a score or you want to begin your orchestration and you're not sure which flutes do I put in my, my orchestra or band, these would probably be the ones that you would use. And these are more, this is more of an, the ones at the bottom are, you know, more for orchestral use and the ones at the top are for general use. Um, and we'll talk about these instruments, um, individually, but. Um, like I said, in concert band, you will always see flute one and flute two. Once in a while, you'll even have piccolo in there, and that's fine. You'll see piccolo, flute, now, and flute, flute. You'll see piccolo, flute one, and flute two. Those those, those are standard uh, setups for a concert band flute environment. You usually do not see an alto flute or bass flute part in a concert band environment, usually because those instruments um, get. Um, very much so covered up by the rest of the band, um, especially if anything else is playing while they're going. You might see an alto flute part, but you don't really see the bass flute so much. It's, it's of though again, those instruments are very situational. You're more likely going to find them in an orchestra where you will see pretty much a layout of flute one and flute two, for usually for sure, maybe just even one flute part. Um, and in some big, large scores, you might see piccolo flute one and flute two. But more traditionally, and what's becoming more common now, is you're starting to see flute one, flute two, and flute three. And flute three is probably the flautist who's going to have to jump back and forth between flute and piccolo, or flute and alto flute, or flute and bass flute when they're relevant. Um, but again, you don't really see alto flute very often. It does exist, and it does. You do. You can go out and find pieces of music with it, especially uh, in modern music. You're, uh, it's a very common find. More not common, but it's more commonly found in modern music than it is in like, you know, you you know, much older music, um, like where you don't see it very often in the Romantic period because it really barely exists at the time to a degree that anybody really knew to write for it. But, like, for example, some good alto flute licks um, really actually come from musicals, operas, and, like, m like modern music. Um, like, a, for example, Once on this Island. Pretty much any time there's a deep-sounding flute solo, that's an alto flute that's actually being played. Um, another example might be the flute solos in the jazz music that presents itself in the anime Trigun. For example, those are alto flute. That's jazz alto flute at its probably its finest. That's some nice writing in there. Bass flute, you almost never see. And the best example that you can do for bass flute is Jungle Book. Either the animated one or the opening to the live action CG one that just came out. You'll actually hear a bass flute on the bottom there. It's a cool sounding instrument. But we'll talk about the specifics of those guys in a moment. Obviously, I know you've all heard flutes and piccolos. If you're watching these videos, 
and you are, you know, a composer already, or you're, you're, you know enough about what, uh, what instruments are out there. You should know what piccolo is. It's a tiny little flute that can pierce the freaking heavens with a beam of concentrated high pitched sound that would level a freaking skyscraper. And then everybody knows what a standard flute is pretty much. Um, and what, now, so let's talk about piccolo first. We'll talk about we'll talk about these guys in order. Piccolo um, has a very wooden side to it. When we th- when most composers write for piccolo, we usually write for the traditional wooden piccolo. We don't, unless specified, or you're writing for a marching band. Usually, your 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 mindset should always be thinking the wooden piccolo because the wooden piccolo makes sounds different than the metal piccolos do. The, and the metal piccolos are for marching. The wooden piccolos are for everything else. Um, and this is relevant for a certain range of that instrument, which we will talk about when the time comes. And what happens when you're writing for piccolo <coughs> in the in the wooden in a wooden piccolo is you'll get a range from D, which is a mis- which many many writers uh, many composers screw this up. They think they can write down here. And think that's the lowest note for piccolo. You would be wrong. That is too low. All the other flutes go that low. Yeah, I know that. I, I get it. Piccolo does not have the keys to do that. Okay. Its last note is here, unless it's a custom flute with the uh, with extensions. Um, pretty much the range from D to middle D. One would even argue you can go up to F, but it just depends on your preference. That range, I like to call it the Ricky Ticky Wooden Range. With a wooden piccolo, it sounds very hollow, but it's still, br- but it, it sounds very hollow. It, it almost can, sounds a little more um, controlled. It's a nice sound. Um, I would have to say that when you're writing for piccolo and you're writing in that range, I, at forte with the rest of the band going, it won't come out as much. But it's a very different sound. It's not the round kind of sound that you would really uh, associate with a regular flute, alto flute or bass flute. It's a very kind of light, woody, wooden kind of sound, like a thin wooden sound. It's a neat little sound. Whenever um, I compose like um, like music a la Africa, you know, that piccolo, the range of the piccolo is great for writing without having to use any specific African winds. If I'm doing like a concert band piece and I'm writing like, you know, oh, you know what, let me give you a better example. Um, you could take like the, the, there's a piece called Africa by Robert W. Smith. And then there's a solo for bass clarinet and piccolo playing side by side. That low, now the, that piccolo plays really high and the, effect, and the bass clarinet plays in its kind of middle range. And what he was trying to do was get the effect that kind of the piccolo can do on its own, but it doesn't have a lot of meat to it, which is why he did what he did, and it was good that he did the way he did, though did it the way he did it. But um, you could have a nice hollow middle sound coming from a piccolo um, in the range from D to about middle D or F, anywhere in between there, depending on your preference of sound. Anything above the F, you start getting into what I call the ear-piercing, you know range. It's not hard for a flautist to just wail and blast and go for it. And that's what uh that's what happens here. And the the thing with that is any time you have a piccolo playing within this range, it will be heard. Oh yes, it will be heard. Okay. If you have a piccolo player playing a, a regular C above the staff, it's going to cut through that orchestra. So if you run a band or you run an orchestra, this is more specific towards band players. Number one, your pick player. If you're the conductor, the pick player should never be to your right. And you would think that, oh, it should be, because that way it actually saves the ear of the person sitting next to them. No, that, that piccolo will cut through so hard. So, so, so hard. It'll be absolutely ridiculous. When I When I would do like honor bands for like you know this you know this you know for different events and stuff and 
I would conduct, I would actually change where everyone sat. I would make the pit. I would make one arc of flute players, not like half an arc of flute players in two rows, then half an arc of clarinets. I actually don't do that. I do um, a full arc of flutes with the pick player on the left end, because trust me, you want some sort of sound control on your pick player, and if you let the pick player kind of just explode. It's kind of a cool thing, depending on what you're writing for, but man, will it just, it'll cover your entire band. You, you, you'll, you won't be able to really um, control it, because no matter, you could have the whole band playing at Fortissimo and have your big player trying to play mezzo forte, it'll cut through it. It'll cut right through that orchestra, which is the whole intent of having a piccolo in the first place, is you want a very high-pitched instrument, that can cut through the orchestra. That's why when we write pick parts, they don't always double what the flute is doing. They are more situational of an instrument. You know, so very rarely would a flute outside of marching band, would a piccolo rather, uh, be constantly doubling flute one and flute two. No, they're very situational. Good writing would be you want to use them when the whole orchestra is going, or you're using them for the specific sounds and qualities that they make. The low end of the piccolo, uh, surprisingly, is a little bit better than the other flutes. It, it projects a little bit more, but it's still the weaker end of that. In, that in, considering the, the strong end of the instrument can out overpower an entire band, the lower end of that, and you know, somebody could argue, well, trumpet players play louder than pick players. I'm like, well, yeah, they're physically playing louder, but the problem with that statement is that the pick will cut through the trumpet player. Okay, which may, gives the illusion that the pick is actually louder. And one would even argue, well, if you base it just on what you hear more, more, more of, then the pick is louder. That's the nature of, you know, audiophonics, I guess. And, and, and so the bottom end of the flute is, I like the bottom, to me personally, I love the bottom end of the flute. I love that wooden kind of airy wooden sound. It's a nice, nice sound. Um, definitely... Um, you know, play around with that range during maybe some soft sex sections of music. Um, have it double instruments that are kind of opposite that sound. So, it, because the piccolo in that range is kind of more of an in-between rounded nasal sound. It's not a full-blown nasal, but it's in-between that in that range. You can have it double. You can have it playing... Um, you know, alongside a clarinet, um, probably not an oboe so much, but like a, a, a lower, the lower end of a clarinet. I would play alongside the low end of a clarinet or the low end of a saxophone. And it's kind of a neat, neat little pairing. And there's a lot of cool things that you can do with that range of the piccolo that most composers don't really do. I mean, you've, a lot of them fall in the habit of just writing it as a blast instrument, which it, it does very well. Um, but there's nothing wrong, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Just keep in mind that there are ver there is versatility in them. Their hills, and piccolo is a bit more versatile than some of the other woodwinds if you know how to manipulate it. So that's just that understanding in a nutshell. Um, and before we go on, I do want to make another generalization of what flutes can do that other woodwinds do not do as well. Um, is they have the ability to double tongue and flutter tongue much more efficiently than their wood their other woodwind brethren. Um, so a lot of brass players, and this is something that drives me up the wall every time I hear it. I was volunteering at a high school once recently because one of my students played over there, and she, her section kept getting in trouble because they couldn't double tongue. And they're sax players. These are high school kids who most of them don't study privately, have probably hardly ever practiced. Um, and this band teacher wants them to double tongue because the guy who arranged it was a drum and bugle corps guy. And so he asked if I'd come in and... Uh, and my, he, the, my student mentioned that I would be willing to come in and help help them figure out what's wrong. So I sat there and I, I watched them do it and I looked at the part and I'm like, okay... So you want these guys to double tongue D's below D, the D at the bottom of the staff. This is alto saxophone. You want them to double tongue D at the bottom of the staff. Okay, I know a lot of professionals that can't that cannot do that at piano, mind you. I know a lot of I know a lot of uh, professionals who can't do that. And you want them to do that? 
That's no, well, and then his first reaction is that well, brass and flutes can do it. Why can't they? And I said, well, because they have something physically inside their mouth. Okay, and I said, you're a, you're a trombone player. You sit here's take a saxophone or a clarinet. Somebody give me. And I actually I think I took a kid's clarinet. I said, here, try to double tongue an open G. You don't have to press anything down. Just blow into it. Get the sound first, and then try to double tongue it. And made him do it in front of the kids. I make an example out of people. You have to. That's how they learn, you know. And so he tries to do it, and he can't. And I'm like, but I, you're you're a professional, right? You're you're a band teacher. Your primary instrument's trombone. He he just got out of college like a couple years ago, so his cho- playing chops should still be in their prime. And I just looked because some band teachers let their playing chops kind of go over the years. But I looked at him and I said, well, play it, play the play it. Try to double tongue it, and it was like two 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 two. But I'm like, that's not double tongue. You're going two two, not ticket 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 Try and then he couldn't do it. I said do triplets then because I do giggity tickety tickety. Which as a kid I learned it when I was younger. I learned it as giggity 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 go. But he couldn't do it. And that's the relevance. So you got a band teacher that's giving you shit about not being able to double tongue on an oboe, English horn, bassoon, clarinet, or alto saxophone. You sh- you give him the instrument and you tell him to do it. Chance there's an eighty percent chance he's not going to be able to do it. And there's a ninety nine percent chance that maybe only one kid in your high school can actually physically do it because it's not. Excuse me, I needed a drink. It's not something that traditionally is asked of woodwind players unless they're flautists because flautists do double tongue and they do it quite well flutter tonguing is situational and it's going to sound different depending on what instruments do it the only instruments i would never want you would probably never want to have flutter tongue or bassoons and oboes the other three can do it just fine but again going back to double tonguing as a general statement um you can flutes and wood the flute section can double tongue piccolo flute Piccolo and flute should be able to do it. When you start asking alto flute and bass flute to double tongue, it becomes muddy, mucky, and does not sound good at all. And so that would be an exclusion to to the rest of the flute section. I would not really expect alto flutes and bass flutes to double tongue. I wouldn't really write anything where they need to do that too much. You know, maybe if they had, it was like da 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 you know something simple where they only double tongue every once like maybe one or two to four notes in one measure and then the rest of the measure is fine that might be a little a little more acceptable for the flute writing but remember the lower you excluding piccolo the lower you go on a flute the muddier and muckier it gets and the less distinct it becomes it loses a lot of its characteristics of being light and crisp and it ends up becoming very dark and murky. And it's a great sound. It's a glorious sound. And we'll talk about a lot of that when we get into uh, flute. The, the primary flute. And so I don't think I need to say much more about piccolo. They can do 16th note runs. They can do arpeggios. I said earlier they can double tongue. Um, you can have them do 32nd note passages. They can obviously trill and do tremolos. So there's not really much to say more about piccolo or kiss for an intro to writing for piccolo there's not much more to say um they can obviously slur they can obviously do tonguing they um pick one of the things you might want to take from this though is when you put a lot of accents in your music sometimes you'll notice that a pick part doesn't have as many accents as everyone else Primarily because pick players, uh, the majority of them, not not saying that they're bad players, this is just something that you, once in a blue moon, will see. You'll see pick players who, they'll get an accent and all they do is just play it really loud. So you might have... And it's just loud. It's not really an accent, it's just played three dyna- two dynamics louder. And I say two to three dynamics louder. I almost said three, but I stopped at two. But realistically, you could say three because the instrument is so sensitive. It's a very sensitive instrument dynamically. When that instrument plays plays something loud, it's loud and, and, and a bit obnoxious. 
Um, but just be weary that sometimes you may need to write pick parts weaker than your the rest of the band. Okay, so if the rest of the band is playing fortissimo, you may you may just write a pick part that says forte, and that that would be maybe some attention to detail in your writing, in your writing, because again, that instrument even with on accents, even on even in a forte piano environment, will will cut it will cut through hardcore, and so I think I covered the primary um, issues that uh, that appear. That come with um, piccolo, so hopefully that um, kind of that'll kind of conclude that instrument. We talked about the ranges. Um, I didn't talk about the top as much because most of us know the top. It's it's loud. Um, it's focused. It's piercing. Um, it's bright. It is bright. It is a bright sound, but I would not define it as bright and fluffy. I would define it as bright and like a bullet. Okay, especially if it's you know. That player is playing mezzo forte or louder. Um, it will it will cut through. So just th- again, those are some things to to keep in mind. And uh, if you have any more questions on piccolo, comment section below. Let's go into flute. And I have two bars. I have flutes one and flute two. I'm really just did that to just show you orchestration and how we would look at this. Um, flute one and flute two. Things are a little different. Um, well, I'll just say flute. In re- a regular flute, a standard flute, its lowest note is usually a B. Some people get the extension with the B flat. So I'm going to leave the B flat out. Okay, so we'll go back to the B natural. B natural is what most people have. Okay, so it's not like a clarinet where a clarinet with extensions, a professional group will always have a bass clarinet with the extensions. Okay, so that bass clarinet can get down to the C, the double C. Okay? That's not as important, but what I'm getting at is that it does exist, and, you know, it's much more commonplace than the B flat on a flute. Either, even high schools buy their bass clarinets with those extensions now, if they, can, if they have the money. Because um, the effect is so much greater, number one, and number two, even better, is there's no need, uh, there's not as much need for a contrabass clarinet. And I'm not talking about the nice rosewood one that I have. <coughs> uh, that's That looks like a bass clarinet, except it's made out of rosewood. It's it's a gorgeous Selmer. It's a giant B-flat bass clarinet, or B-flat contrabass clarinet. No, it, it would be like, I call it the paperclip, and it's a horrible sounding paperclip contrabass clarinet. It's a horrible sounding instrument. Um, I hate that contrabass clarinet. I mean, if you don't have one, use it, but uh, you, you may as well just, you know, get, get hope, hope, you may as well just write it for bassoon part and then use that instrument. Um, if you need to get it lower than the E flat, which most bass clarinets do go to low E flat as opposed to low E. Anyway, we'll get to clarinets later. Flute has a very distinct set of range. Um, and most people, this is where I criticize a lot of flute people who write for flute, who tend to know nothing about flute writing, who claim that they do. Whoops. Um, and because they make such bo- boisterous claims, I tend to um, tease them religiously about, oh, you didn't know this? Tee-hee. And... You know, that ends up being the end of it, but just as all jokes aside, this is the primary range of the flute. Can you get higher than double C? You can. You can get to double D. But again, I always going to pose this question to a lot of people. Just because you can, not a question, a statement rather, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Um, because a high D would actually be so thin it might get lost. Most standard players cannot play a double D. They can play a double C. I expect by... If I were in high school, and being... If I were to teach high school, knowing what I know now, and being a flautist, being a person who plays all the woodwinds professionally, I would expect and teach my entire flute section to play to double C. Specifically, the ones playing first. I would expect it from them. To play in, in double C in tune. Okay, just... That's the way a lot of us look at things. Um, So, 
but to go beyond that is kind of ridiculous. It is a little bit the border of the borderline ridiculous in an orchestration concert band environment. In a solo environment, that is completely different. Okay, and we're not talking about solo work. We're not. That's virtuous, virtuistic playing. Um, where you, as a composer, you have the right to really write whatever you want, as long as it is, is it's mechanically and technically possible for the instrument to do, and that it's not um, obscene. <laughs> and when I say obscene, I mean it's, it goes back to again, just because you can't do something doesn't mean that you should. You could go up to a double D, but you shouldn't write your whole piece with the double D being a constant thing. It's not a, it's not a good idea. But the very much anything that the piccolo can do, technique-wise, the flute can do. And that's why flute players tend to also double piccolo. And if you want to be a professional flautist or you want to be a great flautist, learning to double those two instruments will, will, will do you a world of good. Okay. And going out and buying a, a really good piccolo is a great investment. You'd be surprised how many college students have never played piccolo. I'm like, wait, wait, what? You, 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 you're, you were a performance major and you've never once played a piccolo? What the fuck's wrong with you, man? You're never going to get first chair that way. You're never going to get hired that way. We expect it from most flautists that they can play piccolo. Um, it's just, you know, like it, we expect most alto players to be able to play a tenor. You know, they may not own one. They might own a tenor mouthpiece, but not the actual instrument itself. But if they put their mouthpiece on it to any tenor sax, they can usually play it. It's usually the college way that we kind of, I kind of interpret doubling is. So for those of you who are flautist, go out and learn piccolo. You can actually buy orchestral and band excerpt books for piccolo. Um, there are also some piccolo exercises. I do, however, recommend doing um, certain melodious studies. There's a book of the melodious studies in which um, you can actually uh, do... do uh, it's, uh, there's like 12 exercises in there that you can do for with flute and with piccolo, and they'll be helpful. And actually, the International Music Company's orchestral excerpts book includes piccolo, some piccolo parts. So there's some piccolo excerpts right there for you. So check those out um, if you're an aspiring flautist. But what comes into play here when we're writing for flute is that it has, unlike piccolo that has only two definitive, distinct colors of sound, that kind of little wooden area in the middle of the instrument in the bottom and then the piercing part on the top the flute actually has three of them and one of them is not parallel to piccolo flutes do not have a low woody wooden sound even wooden flutes don't really have that necessarily reedy characteristic or hollow wooden characteristic even when you're playing with um like i said even when you're playing with a wooden flute you don't have those characteristics. So that's just something in and itself. The bottom of the flute, however, is one of my favorite parts of the flute. However, it's one of the hardest parts to, it's one of the hardest areas of the flute to write for. Um, and if you're writing for a high school group, I would even say avoid writing in that range as much as possible or do it in, under very specific circumstances. So those are, you know, we'll, 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 I'm going to go into more detail about this right now. So the bottom end of the flute, anywhere from B flat to maybe G, and I should have, I should have divided that up. I should put it so you can see it a little better here, or actually that range. And even one could argue G. I'll, I'll put it at G. I feel G is a good starting point to this range. The G will be heard better, but as you go down, it you, you start losing substance. And we'll talk about technique in a moment, too. Um, with that range, we're talking B natural or B flat to G. Okay, here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. Once you hit middle, once you hit the low D, um, you start losing dynamics. Um, very rarely do you come across a good flautist that can play that low range loud. And even when they can, I'm one of those people that thrive on the bottom part of the flute. I love playing on the bottom of the flute. All of my students get like 
crazy eyes from their teacher, from their band teachers or their orchestra teachers. Um, my, many of my students play at the local co uh, community college at the college level and uh, who are like in sixth grade and higher. And they all play the bottom really well. And it's just this gorgeous, gorgeous, warm, warming, wholesome sound. The problem is that sound does not project well. So, number one, the problems with the bottom is that, number one, most flautists do not play the bottom well at all. As they hit low D, it becomes airy. Uh, the, the, the dynamics become almost non-existent where they hit nothing but, like, pianissimo. And sometimes you, they can't get the low C, C sharp, B, and even in some cases the B flat to speak. They can't get it to speak at all. They can barely get D to speak. If you're one of those flautists that struggle in that range, you're playing your instrument wrong. It's just bottom line. You're not playing the instrument correctly. Um, <clears throat> it's the case of blowing into the flute as opposed to blowing across the top of the flute that makes that low end speak. Um, which also implies that when you get to different ranges of the flute, you don't play in tune either. So there's an easy fix for that. Um, it's a European style of playing flute is what I'm going to talk about primarily. This is the way I was taught to play flute. Um, this is the way I get high accolade for, and like people saying, Hey, that sounds really nice on the bottom down there. Oh my God. You're really in tune on the top too. I don't, there's no, you don't roll the flute back and forth. That's all bullshit. Okay. Nobody does that. No real professional does that. If you have a college professor telling you to do that, Find out what groups he plays for and see, and then go watch that group and watch it how he doesn't actually do that. He's joshing you or he's bullshitting you. I don't know why, why people still teach this. And even at the college level, I still see it and I still openly mock it. Because as soon as you tell that flautist to not roll the flute back and forth to get the intonation better, and you tell him play, play. The bottom, the the lowest G, the middle G, and the high G, and I want them all slurred, and I want them all. I want to hear them all, and, and without you rolling the flute, they are not in tune. And what's funny is, amongst all flute players, the intonation could be different. Okay, and I'm going to explain how to fix this. I really am. So, pay, take heed and pay attention. You take the neck of the flute, and you roll it in. Okay, not so far in that you're kissing the hole entirely, no. But you roll in and you take your tuner, and if I'm not mistaken, okay, you will you can play two pitches on that instrument, on the neck. It's the A flat, and you play it up an octave. Okay, or no, wait, is it A, A flat? It's one of, it's, I, I'm trying to do this off the top of my head now. Is it A or is it A flat? It's one of the two. Anyway, regardless, that first note you hear should be in tune. Okay, and then you slur to the top note, okay, the higher note on the neck only, and that note should be in tune. Those two notes should be in tune with each other. If they are not, you are, you, your neck, where you're blowing into the flute is not accurate. Okay, you're not blowing into the right place of the flute. Most people think um, that when they do it, that the top note is sharp. Okay, so then they adjust. It, or oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. They think that the bottom note is flat. What was it? Is it the... That's eh, one of the two. Regardless, one of one when you play it, if I had my flute out, I'd actually demonstrate this. Maybe I'll do that in another video. I might just show you guys what I'm talking about. It might be easier to explain. But when you're blowing directly into the flute, those two pitches should be in tune with each other. And you should be able to slur back and forth between them efficiently and effectively, and they should be in tune. You'll notice right away that the quality of sound will dramatically change, especially when you put it back into the, when you reconnect the neck back to the flute, the, the neck joint. You should hear a significant change in the quality of the sound that's coming out of the flute. And that's really the selling point to, to this technique. And the better part is, is that the bottom starts to speak a lot better. Now, you're not going to be able to make this change right away. If you've been playing flute for four, five, six, seven, eight years, it's going to feel awkward. I had to, I get a lot of students, I have to convert to this style of flute playing. But when I do, they just, they sound gorgeous on the bottom. And I, you know, and that's really the thing. And the best part is, is they can play low G, middle G, and double G 
in tune with each other without having to roll out, without having to manipulate any fingerings. They can play the standard fingering system, and all of those notes play perfectly in tune. Intonation no longer becomes that big of a problem anymore. And you are also getting a darker, slightly darker sound, which is great. Um, and it makes the pitch go kind of on the flat side because a lot of flautists complain that they have to pull their necks really far out because okay, they're really sharp. If you're playing properly, you actually will make the pitch go go down a little bit and then that neck will get a little bit closer back to the body of the flute. Again, that's a, a common generalistic thing that you might see as opposed to what actually is the fact. Fact over, you know, it's more anecdotal is the word I want to use. Um... You know, once you know, you might find a flute that just always plays really, really flat, and that's the problem with the flute, not necessarily the player. But um, a good video to really explain this point that I think exists out there. I've only seen it once. Once one of my flute students said they found it, and I watched it for like a half of it, and I'm like, yeah, see, there's a great flautist that does it. Um, it's Sir James Galway. He taught a master class in Texas, and he talks about this exact same technique and how to play. And he actually, I recommend it over me just showing you. Go watch that video, and it will give you a huge amount of insight on 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 how a flautist should be how how a flautist should actually really be trying to get good tone. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Please take a moment to check out more episodes from the RPG Guy Tuesday Night Team Up and more. And please subscribe. Always support the channels you enjoy watching, and while you're at it, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. Keep on gaming hard. See you next time.